everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Midia's video webinar on the Great Monetization Reset. My name is Sian Tedessa, and I'm the Communications Coordinator here at Midia Reset. Uh, before we get started today, here's what to expect. The webinar will be approximately one hour, and the session will start with Tim Mulligan, Midia's lead video analyst, who will take us through a 15-minute presentation on new ways to monetize streaming video audiences. Um, and following this, we'll have Ben Woods, Midia's video analyst, alongside our guest panelists today, who will join us for a panel discussion. And we would also love to hear from you throughout the session. So if you have any questions regarding the presentation or the panel, please add your questions through the chat function. And we'll get to, we'll be able to answer all of those questions at the end in our Q&A section. Um, so thank you so much for joining us again today, and I will now hand over to Tim Mulligan for our presentation. Thank you, Sion, and welcome to Midia's webinar on the Great Monetization Reset. So we've got a lot to pack in in this hour, and my task is to set the scene for the panel discussion which will follow. So to do that, I'm going to give a brief overview of where we are now from the two key forms of monetization that currently exist in the marketplace. And that's the subscription model and the advertising model. And then I'm gonna go in and give a glimpse of what new ways of monetization are currently and in the process of opening up to take us into the next stage of the evolution of monetization for streaming video. So to do that, if we go on to the next slide, I can show you how I've set up this presentation. So if we just, sorry, we just go back one slide, please. Thank you. So there's four sections here. So there's the subscription slowdown, which is where I'm going to give you some very high level overview of media's data showing where we are now with the video subscription marketplace. And for this, we're talking about streaming TV subscriptions, so long form, long form, uh, long form video content, so S4 services. And then I'm going to go on and give a, uh, a quick take on how media sees the fast opportunity, the free ad supported streaming TV landscape, which is currently being put forward as an alternative to address the slowing subscriber landscape. And then I'm gonna move on to giving a glimpse into how media sees potential evolutions of monetization depending upon the adaptation of streaming TV into a digital first content with all the ancillary uh, consumer behavior engagement that that entails. And then I'll wrap up with a few implications before handing over to my colleague, uh, Ben, who will lead the, uh, the panel discussion, which will follow. So we can go on to the next slide, please. So this is the strategic shift that's happened in the, in the history of streaming, of streaming video to date. So the key focus here inevitably is subscriptions, because the subscriptions that have underpinned the transition from traditional uh, linear TV to the on-demand streaming TV experience that is now the norm for consumers. So back in 2007, Netflix made the decision to, to launch a on-demand subscription-based model. Um, that led to a whole wave of, first of all, disruption, but then secondly and equally copies by of sorry, replication of their model by competing services, predominantly tech focused competing services. But then that migrated in 2019 into what media called the DC Big Bang moment, where we had the big established media and comms and co communication major incumbents decided that they also needed to have a subscription video alternative in place to be able to capture the key attention and the entertainment revenue available for consumers who were transitioning from linear TV into a streaming TV uh, successor experience. Now that dovetailed into the great lockdown of 2020 to 2021 when video calculated there was a, an increase of 12% of entertainment time made available to consumers in leading 
uh, leading video markets. This is the US and the UK, predominantly because of the combination of remote working, remote schooling, and the hiatus in IRL in real life entertainment alternatives. So this gave a welcome bump to the early launches of services such as Disney Plus, uh, HBO Max, and, uh, and latterly Paramount, um, Paramount, etc. So Paramount Plus, etc. Now we are moving into a new era, and the new era began last year. And the new era was in many ways categorized by the unwelcome return of double digit inflation into the uh, into the entertainment landscape and it's a first for the digital entertainment landscape prior to last year there had never been double digit inflation in developed markets during the period of digital adoption so we've had close to 30 years of single digit inflation in many of the leading markets, uh, in in Western markets in particular. Of course, this has not been the case in the, the wider world, but certainly in markets as the US and Western Europe uh, and in Australia and other places, double-digit inflation was a new experience, which inevitably has had a dampening impact on the willingness to go for additional subscriptions. The, the the basic calculus is if you have 10 subscriptions, you've got 10% inflation, the consumer realizes they will have to let one of those subscriptions go if they want to continue to maintain the same standard of living going forward. So this presents a challenge for um, uh, a challenge for all the services in market uh, to not only continue to grow, which is predicated on their how they've messaged their positioning to the marketplace, but it's also an increasingly challenge for retention. How do you avoid churn? How do you avoid losing your subscribers to the alternatives? So this is the era that we're moving into. And IRL, in real life entertainment, is a return, has returned as a dominant factor in this. This has also put a dampener on the ability to continue to grow. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. We've gone to the next slide. We can see, first of all, there's inflation is starting to decline. So it's still significant, but it is going down slightly. There will be outliers that continue to experience uh, significantly high inflation rates, predominantly markets. This is the UK that are heavily uh, import dependent. But across the nine markets that media surveys on a quarterly basis, inflation is actually heading in the right direction or well, certainly from a consumer purchasing power parity perspective it's heading in the right direction downwards but what we've also seen is a, an upper limit a ceiling being attached to the number of subscriptions and video that consumers are willing to take on at the moment and this seems to be more or less two um, now this is a constant that's been in in the marketplace for several quarters now and it's unlikely to change significantly significantly over the remainder of this year because of the lingering concerns over the health of the broader global economy and inflation still being a, a dominant uh, a dominant news story but also a dominant determinant in individual consumers lives as well so we've gone to the next slide we can see the positive news story here. So this is a slide taken from Media's 2023 to 2030 video forecast report, which we published at the start of this year. Now, the good news is we are still going to see significant growth. So we've got a 65.8% growth in the number of subscriptions over the remainder of this decade. Now, that is happening because of those markets that are digitally leapfrogging and coming into a position where consumers for the first time in some markets are able to actually pay for their own subscriptions to entertainment in a way they haven't previously been able to do so. So it's very much an emer emerging markets narrative here. And particularly, it's an Asia Pacific phenomenon that we see. And all media's research around this has identified that the key drivers for growth over the next seven years for subscriptions will be 
in Asia Pacific. That's the key focus for additional cons- uh, ancillary growth for subscribe for subscriber business model. But we go on to the next slide. We'll see that the negative impact of this is an it har- well, literally a halving of growth s for revenue growth over this period of time because these services are expanding subscriptions into markets that have significantly lower GDP per capita than developed markets. So to give you an indication of the, the scale of the challenge here, a market such as India, for example, which has been lauded as the where the next billion uh, are currently coming online and becoming engaged with entertainment services for the first time. A key battleground for the likes of Amazon, uh, likes of Apple, Google, Meta. Now, the GDP per capita in India is one thirty one of the GDP per capita in the US at the moment. So, just the basic arithmetic tells us there's going to there even if the growth shifts to markets such as India, revenues will not follow. The revenue margins will close as these economies continue to develop and scale up their uh, their purchasing power, parity and their discretionary incomes and business models are incorporated and adopted there. But it's not going to offset that, that decline in the stagnation of subscriptions in developed markets. Now, if we go on to the next part of the presentation, I'm going to go on to give you a brief overview of FAST before we go on to the monetization third way alternatives. So the reason I bring up FAST is it's presented in the narrative, uh, certainly by the entertainment landscape and particularly by video as the natural successor to free to air TV. Now, yes, it is. But the caveat is the marketplace is not yet there. Because remember, we're in a streaming TV era. So that means that consumers are not TV consumers, first and foremost. They're digital entertainment consumers who just happen to be engaging with video. So trying to put an analog framework onto a digital model is always going to be problematic. Now, we go on to the next slide. We can see the real world implications of this. So this is data from... Media's Q4 2022 survey for the number of consumers who are engaging with free ad supported TV. Now, this also includes AVOD, so there's a big caveat there. And again, it's another one of the kind of legacy challenges of the TV landscape adapting to becoming digital first entertainment propositions, where ad supported video demand, AVOD, and FAST, free ad supported streaming TV. These are acronyms that don't actually mean anything on on a day-to-day basis for the consumer, but obviously have nuances in the monetization implications. But the key takeaway is for all ad-supported, non-subscription-based, long-form TV consumption in a video format, this is still behavior that is not yet mainstream. And markets such as the U.S. that are sorry, significantly above the competition, above the other markets, are there because of legacy behaviors around uh, much greater tolerance and willingness to engage with traditional TV as a background form of entertainment to their wider, their wider life, uh, uh, life choices that they make in the day-to-day, uh, day-to-day consumption of media. These behaviors have not had the time to become normalized in in many markets, markets such as Brazil in particular. uh, TV has always been uh, or traditionally has been an aspirational, uh, an aspirational uh, form of uh, engagement. And particularly around pay TV, it's seen as a value signifier for where individuals have achieved a certain level of disposable income. So what's happening in the US is not necessarily a clear indicator of what's happening elsewhere. And the other takeaway from this is it's a process. We're on, we're on a journey to get to where we need to be. So we go on to the next slide very quickly before we move on to the, uh, the streaming uh, monetization alternatives. We can also see another challenge here. The consumer dynamics demographically We've got traditional TV audiences who are now streamers who are the bedrock of uh, of fast consumers currently. This is a challenge because 
we've got to get the younger consumers engaging with ad supported uh, streaming TV at an equal level for it to have the appeal to advertisers to justify the underpinnings of investing resources, time, brand propositions, and credibility into what is still an emerging consumer dynamic. Now, having said all that, let's move on to part three of this uh, presentation, where I'm going to give you a glimpse into the monetization third way, as media calls it. So we go on to the next slide. We've got four different areas of potential opportunity for growth. And this is, again, this is a positive news story for the uh, for streaming TV in particular, because, again, the linear models for TV, they have to be adapted to the reality that we're now experiencing a digital-first entertainment landscape where TV is part of a wider mix of content available to consumers. So to reach those consumers and to be able to optimally monetize them, the TV industry in particular has to adapt and iterate and learn best practice from digital native uh, alternative media formats, the leading one being games. So we take an example here of digital merchandise. Digital merchandise, the, the idea of being able to buy skins, being able to buy uh, in-app um, in -app upgrades to game playing experiences. These have long been the norm in games. They're not yet, they're not even yet at the starting point of being in the norm for streaming TV, but there's no reason why they can't because the technology is there and the consumers are already doing this. So streaming TV consumers are already doing this outside of streaming TV uh, platforms. So the opportunity is to bring that, uh, that consumer dynamic into the streaming TV ecosystem. The same thing applies to customized pricing, having dynamic pricing, which we're seeing some of now, but we're again, there's an overlying tendency to focus on the traditional binary choice between subscriptions and ad supported, where actually consumers are increasingly nuanced and bespoke and have a more flexible approach to how they want to be monetized in the digital landscape. Other areas of focus, shoppable TV, which we've seen some significant strides by uh, NBCU's investment in this space recently, for particularly for Peacock. And we can see how this has great scope and great opportunity to grow because it actually customizes the traditional shopping TV experience and makes it directly relevant and ties into uh, programmatic product placement opportunities as well, something unique to a streaming TV uh, ecosystem. Finally, but not least, fandom communities. Now, fandom has traditionally been a binary between those, a binary choice between those who love content and those who love content and want to share the love of that content across a community of like-minded individuals. Traditionally, very difficult to do outside of IRL in real life experiences. Of course, these challenges, these opportunities have been sold by games. Music is far along this journey of digital scenes. We're seeing the first glimmers of it in video, particularly around things such as watch parties, which have huge upsides for being able to create ancillary fandom led experiences that enhance the overall digital video uh, narrative and experience itself. Now we go on to the, uh, the next slide. It's gonna give you that kind of schematic overview of the what needs to happen and what is currently happening for moving beyond this digital binary model of subscriptions and ad supported. And that is looking at how content is being adapted uh, through engagement to create relevant experiences that can then be monetized through uh, shoppable video. This is a key part of the dynamic for being able to tailor experiences that reach the digital consumer where they want to be found. If we go on to the next slide, we can see a, uh, a schematic just to kind of underline the opportunities here of creating to bespoke on-demand experiences that take traditional TV into the digital era and actually give a far greater opportunity for monetization upsells than is currently in place with the traditional binary model of subscriptions or ad supported. If we go on to the next slide, 
you can get a, a very kind of high level overview, kind of almost blue sky thinking about what the world could look like once we start thinking in a more digital native perspective. Digital fandom has many ways of being monetized, uh, ranges all the way from NFTs right down to skins, in-app purchases, and all those experiences can be shared, can be virtue signaled, can be used as background experiences for a wider digital and hybrid IRL experience for consumers as well. We go on to the next slide. Now, this just is a very brief overview of the opportunities, particularly in watch parties, it's an area of particular focus for uh, both for media uh, with our video research, but also across some of the leading subscription services that are looking at how to develop and take fandom to the next level of, of interaction and experience. There's a lot going on here and there's way too much to talk about in this limited period of time I have here before I hand over to the panel. But high level is a combination of dealing with talent, dealing with tailored bespoke product development and being able to reach consumers where they are and how they want to engage with predominantly live experiences, but it doesn't always have to be live. It could be shared viewing experiences or create revenue opportunities that are digitally native and are nascent and right now at the beginning of that trajectory of growth. So if we go on to the final part of the presentation, I'm just gonna sum up the implications here. So we go on to the next slide and I won't keep it too long because I know we need to get on to the, uh, the panel part, which a lot of you will be eagerly waiting to, uh, to listen to. So implications here, fandom is the glue that is underpinning a lot of this. And it's that fandom going on to the communal level that hasn't always happened in the past, but in some ways is a natural successor to the water cooler moments. We've got the technology, we've got digital native consumers who want this, we've got the experiences of what's happened in the games landscape to be able to make the same kind of experience happen in streaming TV. The reality of this happens is we create a whole set of new monetizable assets that are native, not just to the wider streaming TV experience, but also to the platforms that deliver them. Doing that avoids commodification. It avoids the arms race of content to try and continually have the next best zeitgeist, the original. You no longer need that to the same degree if you have well-developed, well-serviced fandom experiences that live on your ecosystem. So the tired UX of traditional TV is about to get and is underway. We're getting a significant revamp as we re-equip the wider streaming TV landscape for growth in a maturing subscriber market and in a marketplace where ad-supported streaming TV is still at its uh, early stages of becoming normalized. With that, I'm now gonna hand you over to my colleague, Ben, who will uh, introduce the members of the panel and lead you on to the next part of the, uh, of the webinar. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tim, um, and warm welcome everyone to this section of the webinar, where we will be delving deeper with our panelists into some of the themes that Tim has raised in his presentation. But before we do that, I want to take this opportunity to invite you all to share your questions in the comments section. Don't be shy. Please share them now or during the panel discussion. We'll try and get to as many as we possibly can, and we would really love to see them. Um, so please post when they come to mind. So now let's begin by introducing our panelists. We'll start with Jeremy. Would you like to go first, please, and introduce yourself? Yeah, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Jeremy Forrester. I am a VP of product at Twitch. I'm responsible for what we call community products, which are all of the tools that we give streamers on the platform um, to grow their communities and ultimately monetize them. Thanks, Jeremy. Oscar? Hi, everyone. Uh, Oscar Wall. I'm the general manager uh, for the EMEA region here at Recurly. Uh, at Recurly, we provide a subscription management platform, and we uh, are fortunate enough to work with a, a number of the uh, large global streaming media uh, companies. Um, 
Uh, and uh, my remit here is, of course, to set up uh, our business operations here in, in Europe predominantly. Thanks, Oscar. Avram? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, Avram, uh, The Zone, uh, The Zone X, uh, SVP of uh, Business and Go to Market, uh, responsible for uh, kind of creating uh, The Zone's next generation uh, experiences, live experiences, which, among others, include the uh, watch party and uh, community. And finally, Hannah. Hi, Ben. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Hannah. I'm one of the analysts here at Media, uh, but my focus is usually more audience insights and entertainment crossovers. So super excited to be here with all of these great people from around the industry. All right. Thank you all. Now, let's start with you, Jeremy, by focusing on the power of community. So how does Twitch create a foundation for communities and what drives audiences to spend money on the platform? Yeah, so I might take a little bit of a step back for anyone who's not familiar. So Twitch is a live streaming website where we enable uh, creators to go live and build a community on the platform. Um, Twitch is, uh, all of the content on Twitch is free and we kind of have a patronage style uh, subscription model. Um, so all of the, the monetization that happens through the platform, most of the monetization happens through the platform is, is built on top of community. So it's really important for us to uh, enable creators to, to build strong communities. Um, uh, while when a creator goes live on Twitch, um, they are actively engaging with their viewers through chat and other tools, and they're, enga and they're engaging with the, the people in the community, and the community is engaging with one another, and this builds up this the broader sense of community around an individual, around a content creator and a streamer. And, it, and it's that sense of community that really um, drives people to want to, to subscribe and actually contribute and, and sponsor the creator to continue creating content. Uh, obviously we offer, we offer um, benefits and upsells and, and reasons why it's valuable to join the community. Um, you know, one of the powerful mechanisms we have is the subscription badge, which if you are a paid member of the community, when you chat and chat, um, you get a little badge next to your name that shows how long you've been a member of the community and how long you've been contributing to that creator. And that help drives that sense of belonging um, between the community uh, and ultimately you know, helps drive kind of monetization through the platform. Thanks, Af uh, thanks Jeremy. Sorry, Afram, I'm turning to you now. Community has also been a focus for DAZN through its watch party service service and for those who are unfamiliar with watch parties they are a communal viewing experience where several people can watch the same show at the same time on different screens um, whilst using some sort of social interactive functions such as chatting in, in the text chat or sharing emojis what i want to ask you is how do you make watch parties relevant to both younger and older audiences, because we know they consume video content in very different ways. Yeah, so um, basically, uh, you know, when we look at the um, segments, uh, the audiences um, of uh, the zone, you know, we have a wide range of, uh, of audiences starting off from, uh, you know, Gen Z's um, kind of very digital native all the way to sort of boomers. Um, and um, there's different kind of uh, expectations. There's different kind of digital skills, if you will. Um, and we basically try to cater both because uh, we feel it's important to kind of uh, innovate and, and kind of explore new kind of experiencing of new kind of experiences watching uh, uh, live sports. And um, so we, we provide the wide array of, of um, opportunities to engage with the content. On one hand, uh, for Gen Z, it could be kind of a uh, massive uh, public uh, fast pace uh, uh, chat uh, with a lot of uh, um, engagement and activations, uh, polls, predictions, uh, quizzes. Um, and, and this is where those audiences are uh, comfortable. And we also know that they um, have uh, expectations 
to kind of be engaged in parallel to the live content with additional uh, 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 activities. Uh, we know that they're doing that in parallel uh, with other apps, and of course, we want to keep them in, in our environment. Um, so so for, for the Gen Zs and kind of the more digital native, we provide those kind of... Uh, big uh, public scale, as I said, high pace uh, uh, interactions, um, while um, catering the kind of uh, um, boomers, if you will, uh, those that are lean back, not very used to uh, lots of interaction while uh, watching live TV, we provide more of a subtle, delicate uh, experience where they can just uh, uh, participate in uh, voting, uh, voting for the MVP, uh, participating in some kind of uh, um, um, polls that are triggered from uh, the TV and are, can be easily accessed uh, to participate through the second screen. Um, so we really try to look at uh, uh, the uh, different scales and different segments that we have and, and kind of cater the experiences accordingly. And just leading on from that, what monetization opportunities do watch parties offer outside of conventional models such as subscriptions and advertising? Um, so <clears throat> we've we've experienced and we're looking into several um, kind of models and experiences. Um, I think uh, one of the things that, um, as mentioned before, uh, during the presentation, during the introduction, um, the fact that we have sort of uh, um, either an influencer or a party uh, a moderator or party manager, um, it provides us with the ability to kind of um, lead uh, some of the audiences that participate into the uh, type of engagements that provide potential upside for us or our partners. Those could be e and other uh, commercial related uh, activities, uh, whether it's organic hours or uh, advertisers. Um, the fact that we have an influencer, the fact that we have a moderator or a party operator uh, in the chat, um, it can lead into different call to actions, uh, provide promo, uh, uh, promotional links, uh, and, and have those uh, audiences participate in uh, whatever uh, potential monetization opportunities uh, we or our partners are, are looking for. And, and another area that we are looking for uh, or looking into as well, and have done some experiencing around, is uh, brand integration uh, into the uh, uh, watch party. Um, we have uh, advertiser sponsors who are kind of uh, participate together with us in developing the format of how the uh, content or how the live event uh, would be broadcasted. Usually it's parallel uh, to the main event. There is a specific uh, uh, event that we uh, create together with the watch party, but it is totally uh, sport sponsored. Uh, 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 with our brand uh, partners. And there we provide much more uh, subtle and, and sophisticated, maybe, I don't know, we'll see uh, uh, brand presence uh, opportunities where the brand can participate either through product placement uh, or uh, can be part of the different UX opportunities, uh, user experience opportunities in terms of presence, but also in terms of engagement. So it could be the Coca-Cola party and it could be the Coca-Cola quiz, uh, different ways to kind of uh, put the brand as part of the content, as part of the audience experience um, and kind of challenging the traditional 30-second uh, commercial during the halftime, much more presence, much more, uh, much more engagement and in a much more uh, subtle and, and attractive way, we hope. So sponsorship is is really playing a part here. Um, interesting. Um, so thinking more about audiences now, Hannah, if inflation is putting household spending power under pressure, how do entertainment companies make their IP stand out in the minds of consumers? Yeah, well, that's a 
Great question. Um, I mean, it's it's important to to recognize, obviously, that this this cost of living crisis is not just happening to an already stable, settled marketplace. It's sort of happening um, immediately after, obviously, COVID kind of caused this entertainment boom, and we saw a lot of video streaming services kind of emerge in that environment, and all of them grew really quickly. And that set expectations really high. And now you're seeing not only behavioral changes, people are going back out into the world uh, and changing their priorities, um, but also a, a crunch on spending power as well. And in this sort of crunch of, of cost and uh, cost flexibility, you also have attention saturation and sort of the ubiquity of digital. Um, where you know consumers have had a couple of years to just get used to having anything they want streaming available on streaming at any given time, uh, and that price point keeps going up and up and up, and their their flexibility for it is obviously going down, and the value that they therefore perceive of it is going to be lower. Um, so really, you have to figure out how to stand out in a digital environment of plenty where passive consumption has become the norm across every platform and every form of entertainment that there is. Um, so it's really interesting you know, to hear what's going on with the DAZN watch parties in particular, and obviously um, Twitch is kind of like a social first way of consuming video um, because you have um, you know, different ways that especially younger consumers like to engage that sort of differentiate a little bit. Um, and even you can look to music, which is over dependent on streaming at the moment, uh, where they're turning to stuff like still live and merch sales and events um, to really make up the costs that streaming revenues aren't really quite doing. And uh, you have younger consumers who are really turning to wanting and experiences rather than just consumption. And they want to be engaged and they want to be creative so wanting to to have to be able to stand out in this environment of passive consumption plentifulness uh, you really need to find another way for them to consume in a different context rather than just another thing for them to consume in a passive way um, yeah like and so the, co the cost of living crisis may change how entertainment companies are thinking about how they monetize content but you know, we're not expecting subscription models and advertising models to disappear altogether, of course. So with that in mind, Oscar, um, I'd love to bring you in here to get your view on just how can the subscription monetization model evolve to meet the challenges that we're seeing with the cost of living crisis? Yeah, absolutely happy to, to speak to this a little bit. And um, frankly, a lot of, um, really good information has already been shared in, in this uh, webinar thus far in terms of setting context for this, because um, the consumer is now looking for more flexible um, options. Uh, and, and, uh, and it is all of a sudden a saturated market. Um, incidentally, a lot of uh, Brands have made large, large investments in launching new subscription op offers just in the last uh, couple of years and, and effectively arrived to a all of a sudden saturated market uh, because of the, the sort of COVID boom. Um, and, and what this means is um, specifically the true and tested all you can eat consumption model that has been serving uh, the SVOD growth and, and sort of establishment as the, as the new way to consume television uh, or, or content um, is really coming under uh, some some duress right um, and I think you can you can think of this very logically that um, the the all you can eat model was new and fresh early on it was amazing to get access to this wealth of content um, for a relatively small monthly fee. Um, when you were used to buying or, or renting movies one by one or, or buying, uh, buying movies outright and owning them perpetually. Um, so so it, it, it was a very attractive model to, to attract users uh, or viewers to these services early on. Um, but uh, as uh, the content catalog grew, um, 
it was first seen as something very positive for the for the consumer right you had more content to access and it wasn't all you can eat you can you can draw parallels to a buffet you know you're happy to pay for a buffet even though you only like a few of the dishes and you you eat those and you're happy and you feel like you got value for your money um but because um the market very quickly got saturated and uh, a lot of consumers bought more all you can eat services um this kind of went from i'm now uh, effectively paying for a number of buffets and effectively I'm just nibbling at small bits uh, of, of dishes uh, at each of, of the ones and I'm really not feeling the, the, that I'm getting value for my money yet. Uh, I can only eat so much and I can, I'm, I'm paying for all I can eat in a number of places all of a sudden. Now you combine this with, um, with the cost of living crisis and the fact that the cost for all of these all-you-can-eat models have increased with inflation, but but even prior to that, uh, simply through price increases, you can you can see that this is not um, sustainable. It's a much much more competitive environment, saturated to some extent, um, and and what was once fresh now almost feels like I'm overpaying for something, right? Um, and probably the simplest way to think about this, or the the most simple logical conclusion to draw from this is is that um, the flexibility or the optionality that you need to provide to subscribers is perhaps more niched, more targeted, and more focused uh, subscription uh, offers, where instead of subscribing to more content that you can consume in a lifetime, actually subscribing only to content that you really like and that you want to consume, right? Uh, and this, in turn, and I'm sure we'll speak more about this later, later on in this session, really opens up for involving and combining this with fandom and communities, right? So if I'm now subscribing to a certain type of content, be it fantasy, for example, uh, at a subscription service of my choosing, um, all of a sudden we have effectively content consumption data around this. And, and uh, it's fair to draw parallels to like-minded viewers that, that I might find. Uh, value in engaging with, and it's much easier to build community communities and, and sort of fandom-inspired interactions on these platforms when you limit it down the the, the content that they're consuming. So uh, more niched uh, models is probably the easiest and simplest way to, um, to to logically arrive at how it needs to change and how you can offer flexibility, and that gives a lot of additional opportunity to to monetize differently, bring uh, and drive more loyalty, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Fascinating. I mean, I, I was wondering whether you might be able to go into a little bit more detail on that, um, Oscar. How, how might that look? Is that a case of leaning in on fandom by using things like merchandising or content upgrades to almost offer bespoke deals to customers? Um, I think ultimately, right, where what, what you want to end up with is where access to the community and the ability to engage with like-minded viewers. And, and so if you, if you find value in it, if that is the value add to the subscription itself, so access to the community, if you can, if you can make that valuable and you effectively combine the subscription to the content with maybe a premium tier where you also get access to or even premium access to the community, um, that that is that is um, uh, likely the uh, uh, the easiest way in. Once you have this combination, right, and you have people who engage, um, and there are of course a lot of both direct and indirect effects from engagement, and you can get feedback on your content, you can get support and and uh, promotion even outside of your platform from 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 these communities and fans, right. Um, you can find ways to monetize uh, monetize this directly or indirectly. Uh, so I think that the key thing is to to make the community and the, that experience to to a lot of what um, Avram was speaking about and what what Jeremy certainly uh, builds uh, at Twitch by offering the experience and and making that valuable and something that that is a differentiator. Then you can uh, combine that with with a more niche subscription offer and and uh, and then. Uh, that opens up for opportunities to monetize. Excellent. Um, so, Jeremy, I want to come back to you now. Um, Twitch are, are real experts in, in fandom. Um, we know that Gen Z audiences don't just want to watch, but they want to lean through and engage with the entertainment that they are consuming. 
So can you explain how Twitch is achieving this with uh, your new function, Guest Star, and why sort of dismantling the barriers uh, between the audience and the streamer is so important for that experience? Yeah. Um, so for those of you who are unaware, Guest Star is a, a new tool we just launched, which makes it easy and safe to bring for streamers to bring kind of up to five viewers onto their platform as guests and, and participate in the content. Um, it, it's a product we decided to build because we saw, you know, some of this activity happening on the platform already. And we thought we could make it safer. We could make it easier and, and frictionless for, for viewers and streamers. Um, uh, at its heart, like it comes to trying to build that connection between the, the creator and their viewer. And, and traditionally how that happened was always through chat. So we were like, how can we take that to the next level? How can we allow the viewer to engage directly with the streamer and participate in the content? So um, that's why we built the product. Um, it was built with safety in mind. Uh, one of the reasons why it was, you know, we, we brought it onto the platform, we built it on Twitch. Um, onto the service is is because um, it's because uh, you know now we can make sure that anyone who comes up on the stream we we know who they are they have a Twitch account we can hold them accountable for their actions which gives this layer of safety for streamers that they can bring uh, they can bring guests up but they don't have to worry about what they're going to say or what they're going to do that may hurt their brand or their their stream um, so you know it was really focused on how can we can deepen that engagement between uh, the viewer and, and the streamer on the platform. Um, and, you know, we're going to continue to build more tools in this area um, and continue to help streamers find deeper ways to collaborate um, with themselves and other streamers. Um, with Guest Star, particularly, we're going to look to increase our browser support, which is a thing the community has been asking for. Currently, it's predominantly uh, usable in Chrome, but we want to add support for Firefox and Safari and Microsoft Edge. Um, and we want to give streamers more controls over the audio uh, to really create that experience. But ultimately, we're trying to empower um, uh, creators to create new types of content um, and really create content like this, uh, you know, enable a streamer to very easily be able to bring, you know, parts of their community on stage and, and actually have a conversation about the topic. Um, and we're hoping, you know, strategically, Guest Star is going to help bring new audiences and new creators to the platform, new streamers to the platform, where the type of content they create is really just kind of what we call talk content, which is um, them engaging with their viewers around a particular topic of interest. Maybe, maybe it's like shared fandom, um, you know, uh, shared fandom around um, sports or, uh, you know, fantasy, as, as Oscar was saying, like streamers can really kind of you know, help build a community around those things. Thanks. So, so Hannah, you know, thinking about um, Gen Z and how they're behaving, and and the context of of what Jeremy was was talking about there. You know, why does it make sense for entertainment companies to not only embrace these kinds of behaviours going forward, but also to think about ways of of how they can monetize them? Sure. I mean. It's sort of, um, it depends what part of the industry you're in, I suppose, how easy it is to em embrace these behaviors or how how much the the push is to resist them a little bit. Um, obviously, consumer creative behaviors, which we do a bit of work on here at Media, um, generally we talk about in a social context. They're still on the niche side, more, more prominent amongst uh, younger consumers, but they're not necessarily just relegated to someone doing a, a reel about it or uh, posting a photo you actually have these going like semi-professional um so the bridgerton musical is a bit of an older example now of this but um it was fans of the netflix tv show who went on tiktok and basically co-wrote a musical about it and this became obviously it was kind of embraced at the start by netflix but it, it got to the point where they were having their own events that were competing for spend uh, by fans of the show with the show itself and so you know these things can really become quite big and they can they can actually make quite a lot of money on their own um, and you also have people just getting more creative within uh, the restrictions they have I mean earlier today uh, Ben like off camera we were having a conversation about um, what is it called it's the football tournament in Spain where they're combining it with like gaming dynamics yeah the Kingsley. 
Yeah, Kings League, and they're they're like streaming it on Twitch, and so you you have users who are not only having fun with this, um, but it, it's at a level where they have the tools available to them to make it an almost semi formal thing. Uh, so it's really less of a should you embrace it, and more of a it is happening. You can either choose to go along with it and find a way of incorporating it, and maybe turn it into a marketing thing or a licensing thing. Um, or build a platform around it, or you can sort of fight against it and watch these younger, very creative consumers who are used to having their own way when it comes to the digital world, just figure out a way of doing it themselves. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that is why it is important. There's many ways of going about doing it, of course, which is why it's you know really interesting to have um, the, the rest of you on here, because obviously all of your platforms are doing this in slightly different ways. Um, but it is kind of a, an emerging dynamic that's going to become ever more and more prominent. I mean, Avram, you're really putting um, influencers in the hot seat uh, with your watch party service to sort of encourage some of these lean through behaviors where you, you want people to engage. Um, I just wonder whether you talk a little bit more about how you can uh, tie that into the monetization process. Yeah. So um, I, I think I, I spoke about it a little bit earlier. Um, and uh, I think one of the ways uh, for us to look at the work that we're doing with uh, creators or influencers is sort of uh, looking at what we're doing, not necessarily through the um, perspective, uh, through a product perspective, but more as a format perspective. Um, through uh, what we call the content creation uh, process, uh, where we bring uh, those influencers, those uh, creators, uh, to create a different style and tone uh, to what the traditional uh, premium live sports uh, uh, rights-focused uh, 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 events are usually uh, known for. Um, we try to bring a different uh, style and tone, a different kind of, of experience, both from a, sort of an engagement, uh, of course, perspective, but also from the overall experience of how the uh, content would be experienced. You know, many times we've seen some of our content, um, folks are kind of watching it live uh, on the TV, but they open up uh, either YouTube sometimes or, or even Twitch, to kind of see a different sort of uh, commentation, if you will, uh, to the uh, uh, overall uh, experience. And and we try today to kind of see if we can create an integrated uh, format um, that uh, would, would make sense for those that are kind of expanding into other platforms to hear different uh, commentation to the live content, uh, uh, bring them that um, holistic experience that includes uh, the uh, uh, the influencers, the different style and tone, but also the different interactive capabilities that we provide to engage with the content, to engage uh, with the with the influencers, and 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 here we see a couple of kind of commercial uh, opportunities. Uh, first, uh, it's our ability to attract those uh, young generations, which are. Um, sometimes having uh, difficulties to tolerate to tolerate the uh, existing broadcast experience uh, so we sort of have an opportunity to, to uh, expand uh, uh, these uh, 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 our market or our target audiences that is also true by creating a more delightful uh, uh, sort of an, an experience that accommodates their expectations uh, we have a, a better impact on, on on churn and retention of those uh, young uh, audiences. Um, thereafter, um, monetization, uh, direct monetization opportunities would come through e com opportunities that we have uh, started to develop them in many of our markets. We have the zone uh, uh, store, and it makes a lot of sense to use those uh, uh, engagement interactive opportunities to kind of lead into those e-com opportunities whether it's through specific promotion or even live auctions and 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 stuff like that that kind of makes sense in context of of the game of the league uh, of the different uh, uh, star players etc that 
uh, are participating in, in the event. Um, and, and the last, uh, as I said uh, uh, before, is, is also to use that exploration of new formats together with brands. Uh, see what can we create together that would make uh, sense for uh, the audiences, uh, for the brands, and of course to the right holders. Uh, a, a combination that will make uh, sense and enhance uh, the experience while providing benefits, uh, uh, whatever uh, business objective those brands uh, have in the specific markets that we are, uh, we have our rights and, and we broadcast those live events. Great, thanks, Afrin. So, a question now from uh, viewers. Uh, this one's from Aaron Gordon. Um, anyone can pick up this question if they're happy to answer it. So despite all the negatives that COVID brought with it, were there positive outcomes for your platforms? Anyone like to pick that one up? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to start on this one. Uh, there were definitely positive outcomes for Twitch. Uh, I think obviously we saw people have um, a lot more free time as a lot of entertainment companies did. And, and we saw a lot of people actually looking for community. So lots of people turned to Twitch as either to to stream and then have people come along and you know watch them play video games and just have that that feeling of connection with other humans while we're in lockdown or to come to twitch and participate in communities so um you know while it was obviously there were a lot of negatives that came with covid um for twitch as a service it was uh, you know we saw a lot of people come to twitch for the first time and then either create content or you know come and view it yeah very similar uh for us in, in many ways here recurrently, um, obviously with uh, people having more time for, well, not only content consumption, but but basically non in real life um, uh, entertainment uh, and uh, even work from home, uh, video chats and webinar services like the one we're using now. Um, a lot of those are offered in subscription models. Um, this um, created an influx um, on our platform, certainly from in, in the form of customers. Uh, but what was great for us with that was that these were uh, these brought new uh, viewpoints and and um, were facing new challenges that we uh, were exposed to that we could we could help solve for them. So it evolved our product uh, quite drastically in many in many ways, thanks to the, the influx of, of use cases and, and customers that it brought with it. And that sort of a customer driven uh, innovation is always uh, uh, extremely valuable, of course, and, and we got that in, in, in spades during this time. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us here today. It was, I think everyone would agree, a really insightful um, and engaging discussion with lots to take away and think about. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the audience for the questions. And with that, I will hand you over to Sion. Thank you. Before we conclude, I would like to say a massive thank you to our esteemed panelists and our analysts for sharing your valuable insights with us today. I would also like to say thank you to everyone who tuned in today. I hope that this session was uh, valuable to you. And as a token of appreciation, we will be sending a copy of today's presentation within the next 24 hours for all of our attendees. We hope this will serve as a helpful resource for you to revisit in the future. I would also like to encourage you to join our Medias community where you can stay up to date on the latest industry trends, participate in surveys and win rewards. There will be a short video with more information at the end of this webinar. And if you have any questions regarding today's webinar or if you'd like to be connected with one of our analysts to find out more on how you can work with us, please email events at mediaresearch.com. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today and I'll see you on the next webinar. Hi, I'm Tatiana, and I'm an analyst at Media Research, a leading entertainment research and insights company. The most influential people across the music, video, gaming, and podcast industries use the data and insights we gather from our community to drive strategy. So joining our community is the fastest, most direct way to get your voice heard and drive your industry forward. By joining our community, you'll have regular opportunities to win rewards for participating in our surveys and studies. You'll also get regular reports and data downloads to stay ahead of the curve on industry trends. 
and free entry to webinars and events where you can learn and network. You'll also get access to our Discord server, where you can connect with and even collaborate with like-minded creatives. Sign up today and access a free report on the blurring lines between creators and audience. We can't wait to have you as part of our community.